I'm going to read some poems from Crossing the Equal Sign. This is the first poem in the book. It's about, again, it's about my passion for math um, and about the experience of math for anybody, non-mathematicians also. Uh, but it was written while I was, or on or during or about uh, while I was working on a particular math problem. So this is how it begins. Points were blinking, lines were beckoning. How was I to know? What could I have done? I heard some voices, I had some time. There was a tenderness. There was a weeping. How was I to know the points would not point? How was I to know the lines would not line up? And these poems are all untitled, so I'll just turn the page and you'll know. Okay. A mathematician just sits there. There is empty paper in front of her, and it stays empty. A cat also just sits there with empty paper, but the cat doesn't mind that. The cat, in fact, gets right on top of the empty paper. The cat believes his sitting will fill it up. <laughs> Another problem, was it that? What drove me into math was not Fermat's last, we were talking about Fermat's class before, unsolved for 350 years and finally solved about what, 15 or 14 years ago. What drove me into math was not Fermat's last. I preferred the factoring of the difference of two squares and Cantor's stretched out one dimensional lace. Also, the center of a circle is inside the circle. What drove me into math was not the mystery of the unknown, but the mystery of the known. Other early influences, the point of light just happening to coincide with the only visible corner of our living room, those dark red shapes when you close your eyes tight, and that spot, that nightmare of many bloody colors. One morning I wake up counting. I realize I'm counting and I just keep it up. There's nothing to count, nothing to own, nothing to try to win. I'm practicing counting, preaching counting, maybe even learning to count. In the dream I had not been counting, I had only been wandering. The horizon had been approaching and the sky had been flat. Also that sky might have been folding. There's no reason to count footsteps, no reason to count years, Maybe no reason to count numbers. To fall asleep, you count sheep. What do you count to fall awake? I'm going to end this, I mean, last poem from this book that I'll read. Um, it goes like this. It's towards the end of the book. You can draw pictures without analytic geometry. Straight lines don't need AX plus B. Circles don't need X squared plus <coughs> Y squared. Loops and scallops don't need polar coordinates, but they wouldn't be as pretty. They're prettier with axes running through them and equations running along them. Spirals aren't as pretty without theta. Four-leaf clovers aren't as pretty without sine square theta. Beauty isn't as pretty without truth. Um, and now some more, uh, more recent poems, as many as we have time for. Um, you have five more minutes. Okay. Um, I just sent out a new, a new manuscript called Rescuing the Insides. Actually, I realized I need to read that poem from the math poetry book. Somehow I don't hear it. It gets lost. All right. Uh, to bleed into that. I feel so sorry for the insides of things. I imagine them sweating and cramping. I hear them trying to flex. I know from complex analysis that sometimes outsides determine the insides, and I think maybe the insides are tired of being determined. And most things are inside. Most things are encased. I am afraid most things are alive. I would like to go around rescuing all the insides. I would like to dig into everything and pull the insides outside, but there is not enough outside to go around. If I can't rescue them, maybe I can put them out of their misery. I know I can't shoot them, but I can try to squash them or I can go around injecting poison into them. But well, what kind of poison works for this form of life? Dreams about torture. It's always things that would not really hurt. There's rawness, but no blood. Moans, but no screams. And definitely no marks, never anything gross. And when I'm the one being tortured, I'm also the one doing the torturing. I'm at the controls in some way. 
And if the dream turns lucid, I approach everybody in sight and begin to mold their faces. I stretch, I shrink, I permute, but I don't torture. Once in such a dream, I said to them, I know you aren't real, so I can torture you if I want to, but I don't want to. Besides, maybe you are real. Yes, I'm still afraid it will hurt them more than it hurts me. Um, Parallel without her last line. One more poem. After dinner and a movie, she tells him she's really tired. Is it okay if they take a cab home? Sure, he answers, but first he has a surprise for her. She should close her eyes and he'll lead her to the surprise. So she closes and he leads. Eventually she sh thinks, this surprise is too far away. I'm too tired for this surprise. Finally, he tells her to open her eyes. When she does, she's extremely unimpressed. The surprise is, he explains, we walked all the way home. Moreover, they're in the bedroom. In fact, right by the bed. And he's undressed and gesturing. And note the title, Parable Without Her Last Line. Um, do I have time for one more very short poem? I'll be one more very short poem. Or two more very short poems. Time for that. Very short. One is um, Ritz Films for Two. Dreams for Two, Ritz Films for Two. This scene is about a kiss. It might be a silly kiss, a breakup kiss, a prostitute kiss, an abusive kiss, a kiss between two people who maybe should not be kissing, but we should be kissing, so we do. And this is called for, for all, our, all us writers, after a whole day typing. I don't think in words, I think in letters. Each sails out of my head in some parabolic arc till it gently lands on the correct key. Meanwhile, another has begun. The paths intertwine, wires and circuits, till the keyboard has become another brain. I'm slowly transferring my thinking to another brain. 